One of my favorite things about the citric acid cycle, your TCA, your Krebs cycle, is that it's able to integrate components from all these different metabolic pathways. And because it's able to integrate all of that, it needs to be highly regulated. But this regulation is going to be highly logical, and it's going to take into account all those different pathways that are feeding into it, as well as kind of like what's going to happen to its products. So today, let's just take a look at some of these regulators of the citric acid cycle, starting with where do we want to regulate in the first place. If we look at the citric acid cycle, we can see that we have I have some of these shown in double-headed arrows and some of them shown in single-headed arrows. Just like when we draw any diagram in metabolism, the double-headed arrows or the two-way arrows, these are basically saying that these steps are going to be more easily reversible. So you can basically, if they have a fairly neutral delta G, meaning they can kind of be swayed back or forward direction-wise, depending on the concentrations of things. It's not so big of a deal if you quote-unquote accidentally go the wrong way, because, well, you just go back the other way once the concentrations change. However, now think about a step with a really large negative delta G. What this would mean is that the products were much more stable than the reactants, and so it would be really, really hard to get it to go in reverse. Some examples of this are our citrate synthase step, our isocitrate dehydrogenase step, and our alpha-ketoglutarate dehydrogenase complex. With these steps, as well as our pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, with these steps, we have these one-headed arrows indicating that these steps are not easy to reverse. Therefore, if we were to quote-unquote accidentally go forward, um, go through these steps, we couldn't really change our mind and go backwards easily. Therefore, we're going to want to kind of regulate these go or no-go steps very highly so that we don't go when we don't need to go. So these steps are going to be what we call enzymatically or kinetically regulated. That is, we're regulating them by regulating the enzymes. The other steps are more thermodynamically or metabolically. Um, they're basically regulated by the amounts of the various intermediates. So say, if you have a lot of malate buildup, that would, that would push this forward to oxaloacetate. If you have a lot of oxaloacetate buildup, this would pass this forward to, the backwards to malate. But if you have a lot of isocitrate buildup, that's not going to as readily pass things forward to alpha-ketoglutarate, unless you act if you have, say, the presence of ATP presence, because that would be inhibiting this reaction. Instead, we regulate the enzyme so that when we want to go and make alpha-glutarate, we kind of turn on our isocitrate dehydrogenase. And if we don't, um, then if we don't want to go forward, then we inhibit it with ATP. We'll talk more in a second about why it makes sense to inhibit this with ATP. One step, um, one point I wanted to point out, though, is that there's been more recent research that's basically there's ways in which this some of these reactions, which we typically consider these unidirectional reactions, can actually be reversed. So, for example, isocitrate dehydrogenase can be reversed under conditions where you have a lot, a lot, a lot of NADH and stuff. And so there are kind of like alternative and reverse TCA pathways, which I'm not going to go into, but it's really interesting things. And some of it is involved in research with kind of like the decision of cells to go one way or another and their cell fate differentiation, cancer metabolism, things like that. So definitely something to look into, but something that I'm not going to talk about here. And instead, I'm going to consider that this step is going to be, um, quote unquote, irreversible. We're only going to go in the direction of isocitrate to alpha ketoglutarate. So if we think about the citric acid cycle itself, we have these three main kind of go, no-go points, these points at which we're going to want to highly regulate. These are going to be our citrate synthase, our isocitrate dehydrogenase, and our alpha-ketoglutarate dehydrogenase complex. We're also going to regulate how the pyruvate goes to acetyl-CoA, that is our pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. If we look and we see what these things have in common, well, they're basically, we're kind of losing something. So in our pyruvate dehydrogenase step, we're going to be losing CO2, as well as in our isocitrate dehydrogenase step and our alpha-ketoglutarate dehydrogenase complex. Now, every time you lose CO2, that doesn't mean that it's going to be irreversible. But in these cases, these reactions are um, these oxidative decarboxylations. These are going to be irreversible reactions. And so it's just a way you can kind of remember which steps are going to be um, irreversible in the citric acid cycle is look for those ones that either leave CO2 
or in the case of our citrate synthase, we're losing CoA. Remember that CoA had that kind of quote unquote high energy um, sulfur bond. So not that a bond is high energy, just that the products are going to, uh, the hydrolysis products are going to be a lot more stable than the reactants. And so therefore you're going to be very energetically favorable in order to hydrolyze the CoA. And that's what you do in this step. And so it's going to be hard to reverse. So this step, this step, and this step, as well as the pyruvic dehydrogenase step going into the cycle. We want to regulate these steps because they're hard to go back from, and we don't want to um, kind of commit ourselves to a fate that we don't actually need. Because the citric acid cycle is highly um, integrated with lots of other pathways, and so maybe we want to go through the citric acid cycle if we want to make energy, because we're going to get a lot of NADH that then we can take through the electron transport chain to make ATP. But maybe we don't want energy. Uh, maybe instead we want to link things together. We want to um, take citrate out maybe we, or not even put it into that point. Um, basically, we can make fatty acids. We can make lipids. We can make glucose. We can make glycogen. All these different fates that we could take if we don't commit ourselves to going all the way through the citric acid cycle. So how are we going to regulate all of this? Thankfully, the regulation is really logical. So I think about this CCA as a cycle. We're thinking about it being used to generate NADH, so our reducing equivalents, um, and basically ATP, because the NADH can go through the electron transport chain to make ATP. This is if we're thinking about it in its cycle, because remember, we can take things out of the cycle, and that's a really, really great way to do things like make amino acids. Um, however, that's not going to, if you take things out of the cycle, then you can't keep the cycle going for energy unless you add things in. That is, you have anaplerotic reactions. So if we think about the cycle as a cycle, it makes a lot, it makes it a lot easier to understand the regulation because this regulation is kind of going to be regulated by the amount of NADH and amount of ATP predominantly, as well as other signals of kind of the activity of the citric of the electron transport chain through the calcium, as well as things like feedback inhibition from things further down in the cycle. Let me go through these and illustrate what I mean, but think about what these different allosteric regulators would imply. Remember, an allosteric regulator is a small molecule that binds to somewhere on an enzyme and changes the activity of the enzyme. When you see something in red with like an X or you see a line with a bar at the end, that's telling you that something is inhibiting. And if you have something green, maybe with a triangle, that's going to be telling you it's activating. If we look at what is going to activate and inhibit these enzymes, we see that we see some things in common. Many of these are going to be inhibited by ATP. So our pyruvate dehydrogenase, our citrate synthase, our isocitrate dehydrogenase, we see that all of these are going to be inhibited by ATP. If we think about why this makes sense, well, if we said that one of the things that we could do the TCA for is to get energy, if we have a lot of energy already, it doesn't make sense to keep breaking down these molecules, only then to decide, oh, we actually wanted to store them and have to spend energy in order to store them. And so while those most anabolic pathways are actually going to put in energy to store things like your gluconeogenesis, um, your glycogenesis, basically in those pathways, you have to put in energy, but you don't want to have to put in extra energy because you started by breaking things down before you then built them back up. So if you have a lot of ATP, you want to inhibit these. However, if you need ATP, well, now you want to activate these. And so you'll see that like citrate synthase, isocitrate dehydrogenase, we're activating them using ADP. So this is like the opposite of the situation with ATP. ADP is going to signify low energy, and so we want to activate these. Pyruvate dehydrogenase is going to be activated by AMP, which, remember, is going to even be a sen more sensitive indicator than our ADP. AMP is also able to act by on a lot of um, to activate a lot of different pathways you want that kind of regulate energy because it's able to activate um, allosterically activate AMP activated kinase, which can then um, phosphorylate and regulate a lot of different proteins. But so the low energy state is going to stimulate this. The high energy state is going to inhibit this.
We also want to think about kind of the NADH. We see that NADH and um, NAD plus are going to regulate many of these enzymes. These steps, many of these steps, um, what these steps also had in common was that they were generating NADH, many of them. So our pyruvate dehydrogenase step, our isocitrate dehydrogenase step, and our alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase complex. These were all going to be generating NADH. If we have a lot of NADH already, then we don't want to go down this pathway and make more NADH. Not just because, well, we've got enough, but because what's actually going to happen is if you have too much NADH, you're going to overflow your electron transport chain. If you overflow the electron transport chain and it can't keep up, what happens is some of those electrons can actually like leak out and stuff, and this can cause reactive oxygen species um, or this ROS, basically these highly energetic oxygens, um, they react with those electrons, they get radicalized and stuff, and then they can go and react with proteins and DNA and all this stuff, which is really bad. So to prevent that from happening, you want to prevent there from being a buildup of this NADH. And so if you do have a lot of NADH, you're going to want to inhibit these enzymes. However, it's also really important that you make enough NADH. And so if you have a lot of NAD+, well, this is actually going to stimulate your pyruvate dehydrogenase in order to go and make more NADH. Um, Another reason why you don't want to kind of like build up your NADH is that that's actually going to prevent you from doing glycolysis. Remember in glycolysis, we needed NAD plus and we generated NADH. If we don't have enough NAD plus to keep this process going, then we're going to be, not be able to do glycolysis, even if our TCA was working fine. We had ways that we could get around this, such as fermentation. So by taking that pyruvate, and um, reducing it to lactate by oxidizing NADH to give us back NAD+, this was able to keep glycolysis going. We talked about this a lot in terms of kind of being able to keep glycolysis going because you needed NAD+, but you also need to regenerate the NAD+, because that gets rid of the NADH, and that NADH was actually going to be inhibiting your citric acid cycle. And not only was it inhibiting the citric acid cycle, but it was also inhibiting the last step of glycolysis. It was inhibiting this pyruvate kinase step. If we look at this pyruvate kinase step, we can see that similarly to the TCA um, enzymes we talked about, it's going to be inhibited by ATP, but also and also by NADH. This makes it so that you're not even going to go to the point of the citric acid cycle where you generate all those NADHs if you have too much NADH build up. So that's why um, one of the main reasons why you really need to do this lactate, um, this fermentation and stuff is not just to retain your glycolysis in terms of needing NAD plus as a reactant, but because it's going to actively inhibit the glycolysis as well as the TCA if you have too much of that NADH build up. What else don't you want to build up if you want to go down the citric acid cycle? Well, some of these are just examples of good old feedback inhibition. Remember that feedback inhibition is when you have a product or um, either a direct product or a something like an intermediate that's down the line that's going to inhibit an enzyme that helps make it, whether it's directly helps make it, like the enzyme that directly makes it, or whether it's something a couple steps up in the pathway. But this is kind of saying we've got too much building up down here. Um, go ahead and slow down. If we look and try to find some examples of this, well, let's first let's look at our citrate synthase. We can see that citrate synthase, well, what it does is it combines acetyl-CoA and oxaloacetate to make citrate. Citrate is its product, and it's going to inhibit this enzyme. This is going to be kind of like a direct feedback inhibition where you're being inhibited by your product directly. You also see that it's inhibited by sesenol-CoA. We don't make sesenol-CoA until much further down in the pathway, but when we do make sesenol-CoA, um, so if we go through all these path into this pathway, well, now this is going to serve as a feedback inhibitor of our citrate synthase as well. Sesenol-CoA is also going to serve as a feedback inhibitor of our alpha-ketoglutarate dehydrogenase complex, but here that was actually the product of this enzyme, so it's more of a direct feedback inhibition. You can see that the alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase complex is going to be inhibited by the sesenol-CoA, just like citrate synthase, but it's not going to be inhibited by citrate. 
it wouldn't make sense to inhibit this by citrate because, well, that would be um, kind of like you're stopping the citrate would, you would want the citrate to stimulate this, if anything, because you're, that would be like feed forward um, stimulus, feed forward activation, because you're saying like, hey, get ready for us. We've got some citrate coming your way, which would then be transformed to isocitrate, which would be transformed to alpha ketoglutarate, which then you would want this alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase complex to act on. If we look at pyruvate dehydrogenase, well, here we see that it's going to be feedback inhibited by acetyl-CoA. Similarly to the examples of feedback inhibition we saw with um, citrate synthase, as well as our alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase complex, those weren't inhibited by acetyl-CoA, however, because they were kind of downstream of acetyl-CoA, whereas we want pyruvate dehydrogenase to be inhibited by acetyl-CoA because that's its direct product. And with acetyl-CoA, well, here it's not only coming from the pyruvate dehydrogenase, but it's also going to be coming from the breakdown of things like fatty acids and ketone bodies. And so we really need to integrate how much more we're adding from this pyruvate dehydrogenase step so that if we already have a lot of it coming from our fatty acids and our ketone bodies, then yeah, don't make more from the pyruvate. Instead, we could do other things from it, like maybe we want to go make glucose, link it up into glycogen, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We also see that pyruvate dehydrogenase is going to be inhibited by fatty acids. Yes, well, fatty acids, that's going to provide enough of our acetyl-CoA. And so we don't need to make more of acetyl-CoA from that pyruvate. We have a lot of more things we could do with pyruvate than we could do with the fatty acids because pyruvate is more one of those like can do anaplotic and stuff like this. Basically, it can go more directions than acetyl-CoA, which is just going to have these two carbon units compared to our pyruvate, where we have three of the carbons and we can do various reactions with it to interconvert it in different ways. But in order to keep make that happen, we need to prevent it from getting broken down into acetyl-CoA. And so we want to inhibit it under those circumstances. If we have a lot of CoA, however, well, now we're going to actually want to activate this step. Just like we can kind of talk about ATP and ADP, um, and we can talk about NADH and NAD as kind of being two sides of the same coin. So the amount of total NAD or NADH you have, like the combined total is going to be constant um, pretty much, but the ratio of them is going to be different. And so if you have a lot of NADH, that also means you don't have much NAD+. And if you have a lot of NAD+, that means you don't have much NADH. Similarly, if you've got a lot of free CoA, that means that you don't have a lot of acetyl-CoA or something else CoA. But if you have a lot of acetyl-CoA, you're not going to have much of your free CoA. If you have a lot of free CoA, well, this is saying, okay, well, we, we need to make some more acetyl-CoA, basically. And so if we have a lot of CoA, that's going to kind of stimulate this pathway to go forward. It's kind of like a feed-forward um, stimulation in the case of our pyruvate dehydrogenase because it is one of the reactants as well. Um, and so it's kind of going to um, stimulate it allosterically as well as kind of just because you need the CoA in order to, in order to function. Having a bunch of free CoA is going to tell you that you're not clogged up, basically. You're efficiently using this CoA. You've got a lot of it free. So let's go ahead and let's actually use it to do things. Let's break down that pyruvate. Let's make it acetyl-CoA. Um, but if we have a lot of acetyl-CoA built up, it's either because we can't like keep up with putting it into fats or we keep, can't keep up with using it in the tricarboxylic acid cycle. And in those any of those cases, we don't want to just keep building up acetyl-CoA, which then could do things like go and make ketone bodies, which aren't inherently bad. Um, but if you have the buildup of them because your CCA isn't working and stuff, um, that can cause problems like acidosis. Okay, so we don't want to build up acetyl-CoA, so let's not make too much pyruvate, dehydro have pyruvate dehydrogenase work too much if we have a lot of acetyl-CoA build up. But if we have a lot of free CoA, if we don't have much energy, if we've got a lot of NAD+, then let's go forward. We also see that pyruvate dehydrogenase is going to be activated by insulin. If we think about insulin, well, here it's not going to be acting as an allosteric regulator, um, like a small molecule, but it is going to be acting like more hormonally. So insulin is that pyruvate dehydrogenase, although you can't really see it in this diagram, is actually going to be regulated through phosphorylation by a pyruvate um, dehydrogenase kinase, and that phosphorylation could be removed by pyruvate dehydrogenase phosphate, phosphatases. And those the phosphorylation inhibits it, 
and dephosphorylation activates it. The insulin activates the phosphatase, which dephosphorylates it. And in that way, the insulin is able to activate pyruvate dehydrogenase indirectly. Why does this make sense? Well, if we think about what's the role of insulin. Insulin says, let the glucose in. It's when you have high blood glucose. Um, and so what, what do you want to do if you have high blood glucose is you're going to actually want to take it in and maybe do things like you might want um, to go and make fat from it, store it as fat. In order to store it as fat, you first need to break it down into acetyl-CoA. That acetyl-CoA can then enter the TCA, be converted to citrate. The citrate can be removed from your mitochondria, and then it can be converted into your fats. It's a kind of roundabout way, but it happens because acetyl-CoA can't come in and out of the mitochondria, um, but citrate can. So you have to kind of go this roundabout way where you turn it, change it into citrate, and then you take that citrate out and change it back into acetyl-CoA in your cytoplasm. But if you have insulin, this is going to stimulate this, um, like in your liver, because you want to hook the, use that pyruvate to build these fats when you're in your liver. You don't need to do that in all your tissues because you, all your tissues can't make fats, um, but your liver can. And so you want the insulin to be activating pyruvate dehydrogenase in those tissues. And if you have a lot of fatty acids building up, well, then you want to inhibit this because you don't want to go and make too much more. So that was our pyruvate dehydrogenase step. And we saw that it was going to be regulated by a lot of similar things as we saw in the enzymes in our citric acid cycle. We're going to be inhibited by NADH. We're going to be inhibited by ATP. We're activated by AMP, by NAD+, um, things like this. Now let's think about um, what else. One of the other things that we see is going to be our calcium. It's a little hard to understand why the calcium does this, but calcium, you can think of calcium as an indicator of the activity of the electron transport chain. You take the NADH and that FADH2, such as that you were making through the citric acid cycle, and you use it to pass, you pass off electrons from it through this pathway of electron carriers. And as you do so, you're pumping out protons. You use the energy from those favorable pass-offs in order to pump protons into the inner membrane space. This builds up a high concentration of protons, um, this proton gradient. We use the gradients like the power of a water dam um, or hydro hydrolytic power plant, whatever, um, to basically power a sort of water wheel. But in this case, it's a proton wheel that's moving sideways and making ATP. This really cool um, protein ATP synthase. This proton gradient is used, the power of the gradient is used to make ATP, but the power of the gradient can also be used to do other things, such as to import various molecules. This gradient has it such that we have a more positive out here in your inner membrane space and more negative inside. If you think about calcium, well, it's also going to be positive. It's got that two plus charge. And so the electrochemical gradient is going to be um, favoring its import into the mitochondrial matrix. There's also more complicated regulation in terms of the channels and things that it could go through. But you can think about the import of calcium as kind of being a measure of the activity of the electron transport chain. If that electron transport chain is up and running, well, then it go makes sense to go and actually um, make more NADH. But if the electron transport chain, if you have problems happening, well, then you don't want that to be more um, NADH to be made. So let's go ahead and let's stop that. So we see that in these steps where we're generating this NADH, we're also going to be in activating it with calcium and I'm often going to be inhibiting it by NADH. NADH is also going to regulate pyruvate kinase as we saw before, but pyruvate kinase, it's also going to have additional regulators. So remember that pyruvate kinase, this was where we were basically, that was our last step in glycolysis. We we're going from phosphoenolpyruvate to pyruvate, another one of those kind of quote unquote irreversible steps. In this step, we are being activated by our F16BP. That was an example of feed forward activation because F16BP was going to be made up, or, um, up higher in the pathway. We also saw that it was going to be inhibited by acetyl CoA, similarly to we saw with our pyruvate dehydrogenase. In both of those cases, it's kind of an example of our feedback inhibition. We also got inhibited by ATP, by NADH. Um, and so these were going to be similar kind of regulations for our pyruvate kinase and for our pyruvate dehydrogenase.
We also see that both of these were going to be inhibited by our fatty acids because, well, if you've got a lot of fatty acids, we have alternative sources that we can use in order to make that pyruvate, I mean, in order to make the acetyl-CoA. So let's let, we can use those fatty acids to make it because we can do more of those things with pyruvate than we can do with the fatty acids. Um, we could do more of the things with those other sugars than we could do with the acetyl-CoA. So it makes sense to kind of th keep things in these bigger pieces we can do more stuff with um, before committing ourselves to going down this fate of, of the, um, the acetyl-CoA, the citric acid cycle, or the fatty acid synthesis. We can also get plenty of pyruvate and stuff from alanine. So if we've got a bunch of that, um, we don't need to go and make more of it. And so we'll see that if we look at our big picture, we're going to have alanine be inhibiting our phosphoenyl pyruvate. We can get plenty of that pyruvate from alanine if we've got a lot of it and things like this. So these are just some of the examples of the regulators, but there are lots of other regulators and they all kind of make the same sort of logical sense. You see feedback inhibition where things further down the line are going to be inhibiting you from making more. Um, we don't want to back things up. And you see if we forward stimulation, things further up are saying, hey, get ready for me. I'm coming your way. We also have hormonal stimulation. So in the case of pyruvate kinase, we see that in our liver, it's going to be inhibited by glucagon. Well, glucagon, that was going to be um, basically saying glucose is gone. We've got low blood sugar. If we've got low blood sugar, well, you might think, okay, well, then we want to make energy, right? But this is happening in your liver. Your liver is going to prefer to actually use fatty acids over glucose. This makes sense because you don't want your liver to be using up all the glucose. Instead, you want your liver to, when you have low blood sugar, you want it to be making glucose and sending that to your tish other tissues. So note that this is in your, in your liver, in your muscles, however, well, here you're not even going to respond to glucagon because you can't make glucose. And instead, if you have low blood sugar, you're probably going to want energy. And so it wouldn't make sense to be stimulating, um, to be inhibiting this. Instead, you might want to be going and breaking things down and making energy. But in your liver, you're going to be wanting to make glucose and sending that forward. No, however, this is not going to keep you from breaking down fatty acids because fatty acids don't need to go through this way. Instead, those fatty acids, they're going to um, come and they're going to enter at your acetyl-CoA. You're going to take those fatty acids and you're going to be able to make your acetyl-CoA, which then you could feed into this pathway. That's going to have different regulators than you saw with your pyruvate kinase, um, but you, don't, you can regulate them separately and still get sources of acetyl-CoA depending on your energetic needs and you, what you have in terms of fuel. So although it might look complicated, the regulation is actually fairly logical. Um, just think to what, what they have in common, what they don't have in common, why that makes sense, why some things are going to be feedback inhibition for one thing, but feed for, you would want them to be feed forward stimulation for something else. You just have to think about where things are in the pathway what alternative points there are to get to there, that point, and what alternative fates there are for that molecule. You also need to think about which steps you would want to regulate. So look for those steps with the one-headed arrow, steps where it's gonna be really hard to go back from. You don't want to accidentally go forward if you can't go back, but for those steps where it's easier to go back and forth, well, here we just need to change the concentrations a little bit and we can skew the direction of the reaction. Hope that helped you understand um, the regulation of metabolism. Yes, it can be complex, um, and but it is really beautiful. But some of one thing about the complexity is that there's no sort of like simple cure all or like when you think see things like supplements or whatever. Just remember that your body has all these crazy ways in order to regulate what's going on. And so if you try to mess with that, like it's just going to reach homeostasis. Like it's not going to do anything most of the time. I mean, unless you do like take crazy amounts of stuff and then it's going to like mess you up. But if you just think, okay, well, maybe if I just take this one metabolite, it's going to boost my energy. It's going to do all this great stuff. Remember that that's probably going to feedback inhibit something, um, feed forward, stimulate something. And so you could have these unintended consequences and things aren't going to just be as nice as, oh, I just, um, I want more energy. Let's just eat some citrate, um, just boost my citrate and then blah, blah, blah. Yay, everything's nice. Okay, well, no, that citrate's going to inhibit your citrate synthase and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And your body's going to find ways to adapt.